Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is The Common Room, and I'm Jonathan Friedman, PEN America's conversation series about free speech, diversity, and inclusion in higher education. PEN America's mission is to celebrate creative expression and to defend the civil liberties that make it possible. And I invite those of you in attendance today to consider joining our national membership of writers, journalists, scholars, and their allies in support of our mission. Today, I am delighted to be joined in this program, sponsored also by the American Historical Association, for a conversation about one of the most pressing issues I think is um, on many faculty members' minds, and that's academic freedom. Uh, in particular, we'll be focusing today on academic freedom and the history classroom, and I'm I have the pleasure of being joined by three distinguished historians to talk about this issue. First, please join me in welcoming Hassan Kwame Jeffries, Associate Professor at, of History at The Ohio State University. It's great to be with you, John. Thank you. Welcome. Laura McEnany, Vice President for the Teaching Division at the American Historical Association and Professor of History at Whittier College. Great to see everyone. Thank you. Welcome, Laura. And Jonathan Zimmerman, Professor of Education and History uh, and History of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, John. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. So I thought we would get right into it um, uh, quickly with, you know, starting with a question for all of you uh, to reflect on just generally, why do you think academic freedom is important? Let's start with you, Hassan. Well, I think it is, it's not just important. I think it's essential uh, to the free expression and exchange of ideas. Um, I think we have to provide space for scholars and thinkers uh, to think aloud, to share ideas without fear of uh, reprisals uh, or fear of, you know, essentially losing their jobs. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that you escape criticism. Uh, that just means you have the space uh, to share ideas that many will agree with, many may not agree with. I think the, that, to me, shouldn't be controversial. I think where it becomes a challenge uh, is when you move into ideas that that can actually cause harm, right? And can, can ideas cause harm, right? And then that become, that is where I think if you, you really have to sort of sit down and say, okay, uh, you know, this idea of sort of blanket carte blanche, you can say whatever, do whatever, we, we almost have to move case by case. Let me bring you into this, Laura. When you think about academic freedom, why is it important? What does it mean to you? Well, I, I, I want to think about this as a teacher and think about the fact that the classroom has to be a space of academic freedom. And I, and I wonder actually if we often talk about safety in the classroom, which I will and believe in, but I wonder if freedom is a better word than safety because there's a way in which if we can create a classroom with academic freedom, we are giving students freedom to roam to the outer boundaries of their curiosity without censorship, without punishment. That doesn't mean without accountability, but it means that we give them freedom to roam. And, and I, think, um, I, I think one of the beauties of practicing academic freedom in the classroom is it means students can practice this in a democracy. If we create that freedom in our classroom, it means that we give our fragile democracy a chance uh, because we enable students to practice it outside the classroom as well. And John, what about you, academic freedom? Uh, well, the only thing I'd add to the eloquent comments by my distinguished colleagues is that we live in a time where our political culture doesn't really resemble the ideal that Laura just laid out, quite to the contrary you know, where you turn on the television and you see talking heads just shouting at each other and demeaning each other. Um, and to me, that's all the more reason that we create the kind of spaces that Laura was describing um, so that we can give people practice in a different and I think better way of exchange. Um, to Hassan's point about ideas causing harm, I agree with him. But I actually think that that's one of the reasons that we need academic freedom is to challenge harmful ideas. So if you think about the role that eugenics played in the early 20th century in the academy, if Franz Boas and W.B. Du Bois hadn't had the freedom to challenge those ideas or Elaine Locke or any of those people, then they would still be regnant, you know, uh, instead of dismissed. Um, so it's precisely because there are harmful ideas that we need the freedom to challenge them. 
but that can be such a challenge. I mean, in a charged classroom environment, I, I know it's different in the virtual realm, but certainly before and certainly what after uh, COVID uh, and this kind of virtual moment, um, polarization is probably not going away, even if it lessens a little bit. I'm just wondering, you know, how you might think about what it is that, that, that professors in particular, history professors can do to kind of balance these tensions between ideas that are harmful, speech that is harmful, um, the different and diverse identities of students in a classroom, and this kind of ideal of freedom, which often, you know, feels honestly very difficult to nurture in a classroom environment. Hassan, what do you think? Well, I think that is one of the, the challenges and, and, and not a challenge for uh, faculty members, for, profess for professors. I think it's one of our challenges, one of our duties, one of our tasks, one of our assignments is to create a space in the classroom for this exchange of ideas where we can present different sides. We can, uh, I don't wanna say referee, but we manage the conversation and discussion. Um, I, I think that is what, that is part of, especially as, it, as historians, you know, that is what we're supposed to be doing, right? And, and helping our students uh, then uh, develop the skills to analyze and to critically analyze, right? Saying, okay, this is one perspective, this is another perspective, right? And this is, now what do you think? What's the evidence? What's the strength of the argument? Where do you see the flaws? Like, I, I think that's where we should, where we should be. Now, I think part of the challenge is, uh, as, 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 as uh, Professor Zimmerman pointed out, like we don't live in sort of an academic vacuum, right? Like we are a part of this broader political culture and kids are bringing into the classroom, not only these ideas, but also attitudes and, and learn behaviors for how you engage in conversation and discussion. So part of our challenge is to say, okay, we gotta leave that outside. And this is how we actually have like fair and honest and open discourse. Laura, John, want to jump in? Yeah, I, you know, one of the things I think is important about academic freedom in the classroom, as I said earlier, is it models something. But if you feel academic freedom as a student, you feel a kind of social freedom too, I think. Um, a freedom to hang out with people who have new ideas, to hang out with books or texts that, that bring you something new. There's a social freedom for young people that I can't, I think, can come with academic freedom. But the balancing act in the classroom is hard. And one of the things I've toyed with um, as the atmosphere gets more charged, as Jonathan said, um, is, is this idea of balancing between a mistake culture in a classroom and an accountability culture and holding these two things at the same time. And a mistake culture without accountability culture, it seems to me, is simply um, irresponsible, right? Ah, I made a mistake. And accountability culture without a mistake culture is gotcha. <laughs> and and it's, I think we, we need both in our classroom cultures to give students academic freedom, but also a sense of social freedom to experiment and to hold those two cultures in one classroom is really a difficult balancing act, I think. I mean, the only thing I'd add there is, again, I share this ideal, but I think that there's a lot of very compelling and disturbing evidence right now that our students don't feel the kind of social freedom that Laura and I want. So there was just this study that, that FIRE put out. It's from 22,000 students on 55 campuses, um, mostly elite ones. And what it confirms is that a majority of the students don't feel that. Um, Republicans are more scared than Democrats, but Democrats are scared too. And yes. since there are more Democrats in raw numbers, you could say there are more scared Democrats than there are scared Republicans. And what are they scared of? They're not scared of the long arm of the state, uh, which they might've been in prior eras, say during the Cold War. They're scared of peer recrimination. Yes. Um, uh, and which I can totally understand given some of the things that you see on social media. But I think that's an enormous challenge. On the one hand, we're asking them to explore and we're asking them to take chances, but they turn on their computers and they see what happens to people who take chances and they don't, they don't wanna take that risk. Yeah. But, but I mean, go ahead, Laura. Yeah. Well, also I wanna say the stakes are high here because if young people don't experience the beauty of this freedom, they won't defend it. They won't defend it. And, and there's, 
There's an authentic freedom experience they need in a learning space. So they will keep defending it, not only inside the classroom, but outside the classroom. You have to experience the beauty of that freedom to, to make something at stake, to defend it in all kinds of other spaces, I think. You know, I wonder though, I wonder, I agree. I, I totally agree with that. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the students, right? And, I, I, and, and you know, the students who come into the class and, and thinking, I mean, just to take for the, the, the current moment that we are in and this pandemic, and we know that, you know, you have millions of people who say this is a hoax, you don't need to wear masks. All right, so suppose a student comes into the classroom, in your classroom, like, you know, we're talking about you know, sort of the global consequences of government response to, uh, you know, to crises, and they say, you know, th this isn't real; it's a hoax, right? And now they have the freedom to say that. And if if you have you know students in the class who are like that's crazy, right? And then other students, you know, like wait a minute, you know, I'm very much of the mind that science holds, you know, holds the truth here, right? And so if a student, you know, they, they pile on to that student, what you have, that's the consequence of holding an insane idea, right? Like in the moment, like, I, I don't, I don't know if like, if that is what you're afraid of, right? Like people pouncing on you and, 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 I, and I'm not literally being pouncing on you, but people then, you know, pushing back hard, right? And in emotion in these ways. And I'm like, look, that's part of you. You're accountable for holding that belief. If you haven't done the homework, to, to see the evidence behind your, the, behind your, behind your position. Yeah. But that's, you know, to me, it's that question when you said a minute ago about the professor as referee, you know, the ref, when I think about a referee, most of the time, I, you know, let's take a sports analogy, right? The referee is somewhat neutral, right? The referee doesn't have necessarily, I don't know, an investment in um, one side or the other, but when it comes to things like truth and facts, historical accuracy, um, I, you know, it doesn't seem enough to me for a professor to only kind of allow that, I don't know, let's call it like that marketplace of ideas without a degree of, you know, expertise or academic commentary. And I don't know if any of you have ever had a student who is extremely kind of confident or ornery in their stubbornness to say things in class that you might think are completely out of left field. It's very difficult to kind of balance both being the expert and neutral referee, isn't it? It's very hard. I mean, and, you know, I, I actually wrote a book about the teaching of controversial issues that tried to parse exactly this question. And we tried to distinguish between what's a legitimate controversy to talk about in the classroom and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And um, to be a legitimate controversy, there have to be well-informed people on both sides of the issue. Um, so look, there are millions of people that don't think you should wear masks. There are millions of people that don't think that we share DNA with other creatures. Um, I believe it's their right to believe that. I believe it's their right to shout that to the hills. But I won't debate that question with, with my students. And if it comes up, I'll just say, we're not going to debate this. Um, now, um, how to enforce mask mandates? Who should pay for vaccines? There, uh, you know, there are a million debatable questions, right? Um, but whether masks help interdict um, uh, the acquisition of the coronavirus, it, to me, it's not a controversial question. And I think you can, you can put it aside and you can say, look, this is America, you have the right to believe and say anything, but I'm not going to debate that question in my classroom. Those aren't inconsistent things to say. No, I, I think that makes... <laughs> I, I agree completely. And I think that is the, um, the right approach to take now. But if we expand that out, then it becomes, OK, well, what else falls into this era of legitimacy and illegitimacy? Right. I mean, so questions of racism uh, and white supremacy. Right. These ideological beliefs. There's no biological difference between anybody. Right. But yet these are these inform people's actions and behaviors. So how then, even if somebody says, well, I'm a racist, so this is my position. I mean, few, few, those are few and far between these days. But yeah. if, if the argument that they're making is grounded in that, now we're moving in, I think, a different, a different place. And it's like, okay, you know, how do, how, you know, what's the management there? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm thinking about what the two of you are saying, and I'm thinking that classrooms, classrooms are such emotional spaces, <laughs> or, or can be, right? They can be really emotional landscapes. Um, 
but they are also settings in which historians apply the methods, right? And so when I hear you say that, John, we're, we're not going to debate that. Um, I, I wonder, do you explain to the students why? Is it sort of like a lesson in methods? Because we live in an evidence-based universe here. And in this classroom, we are, we are using the method um, and we cannot, we cannot veer from the method. And this to me is the beauty of teaching history because when we feel like the emotional landscape is getting too rocky, we lean on the method and say, right? And challenging those racial ideas Hassan just raised. We have a method of discovery. We live in an evidence-based universe in my classroom. And that's why we can't dot, dot, dot. You know, there was, there was a, a case in the news uh, some time ago, maybe last year, of a student who gave a presentation on replacement theory. I'm not sure if it was in a history classroom, okay. but it was uh, uh, in a class to other students. They, replacement theory is a debunked, I mean, I don't even say debunked, it's just so outrageous. It's a white supremacist nonsense uh, ideology that uh, uh, has to do with, you know, uh, uh, I mean, it's as close to, I think it's like not quite QAnon level nonsense, but it's close. And, you know, if you're a professor, how do you handle that tension in that moment where, let's say you even have uh, uh, students of color in the classroom, you probably do, who are essentially you have a white student in that case, presenting on how those people are, you know, trying to take over the country and deprive it of its white heritage. I mean, there are some pretty strong um, and, uh, you know, strongly held, but also simultaneously extremely ludicrous ideas out there. Do you stop a student from talking? Do you intervene and say, you know, your presentation is illegitimate? What do you do? Well, you know, as, as a, uh... As a faculty member at a, at a, at a major football university, uh, the Ohio State University, Big Ten, right? You know, you got to throw a flag sometimes, right? I mean, as, as you, know, you jump in, it's like, hold on. So I, I, think there's, I think there's a couple things here. I, I think it's always, in thinking going back, um, uh, Laura, to your point about the classroom, right? And sort of classroom management, and this is our universe, this is our space. You know, there are students, and I think we just have to be aware of this. With certain issues, there are students you have to correct and there's students you have to protect. And I think that factors into how you manage a situation. Now, you know, it, it very, well, what may, very well may be that the introduction to this is, okay, now we're gonna hear, right, the white supremacist version of what happened, right? And then you go, so you've already framed this in a particular way. But if this was, um, if, you're, if you're actually opening it up and, you, and this comes completely from left field, then that's where the flag goes up. And I think that's what this is, this is this is this lacks legitimacy, and these are the reasons. And we're not going to go any further with this. I mean, that's I, that, that's yeah. so much. And I agree with that, but I think the reasons are the key. So right. the problem with replacement theory isn't that it's hateful, even though it is. The problem is that it's false. Mm -hmm. Those aren't mutually inconsistent, and it is hateful. But that's not the reason that we throw the flag. Um, we throw the flag because it doesn't hold evidentiary water. Right? I mean, it just doesn't. Um, now, it's been hugely powerful in places like France. And indeed, you know, um, the New Zealand shooter was like a big replacement theory guy, you know? And, um, you know, it, it might be a good moment to, rhyme, to remind people of that, right? So to move the question away from, you know, what is replacement theory bad to, you know, what role has replacement theory played in modern culture, right? Yes. right? Right. and in modern behavior. Um, that's something people should learn. I bet a lot of people in that room didn't know that that, that guy Tarrant in New Zealand was a replacement theory and cited it like in his manifesto. Mm -hmm. And so you could make it into a teachable moment that way um, for people to understand, you know, get beyond the question of like, you know, is replacement theory bad to like, how is replacement theory operating within a context of like global white racism? People should know that. I, I completely agree with that, that again, as historians, we can lean on the method. And where I see this happening in my classroom is often sort of in, um, not when extreme views are sort of coming into view, but 
you know, I often think that when I teach history, I'm, I'm being additive in a student's life. Uh, in a, I'm giving you a tool. I'm giving you liberation from an old myth <laughs> that you thought was true and now it could not be true. But guess what? They still want it to be true because there's something they hold dear, they hold sacred about that. So they're experiencing our narratives as loss. And that's when we have to attend to that emotional landscape. But we have to offer loving critique and a tool like Sam Weinberg's civic online reasoning, like the historical method. Um, and we have to stick around with those students in case they change their mind. We have to be the teacher for all seasons of their, of their thinking and their growth and their development. But we have to insist on uh, an evidence-based universe while we're doing that. And I think we can do all those things, but it's also what makes teaching really hard right now. Yeah, that emotional, it's interesting to think about that, that kind of emotional space and what you were talking about your remarks earlier about a kind of space for um, forgiveness and kind of experimentation at the same time. And, you know, I, I used to teach, I haven't done it in a while, but I certainly remember the arc of the semester, which was like students do, you do have those pivot moments where they start to see an issue a different way. And if, if I, I always worry that sometimes we're turning away uh, with strong responses in some of these moments, people who we really ought to be educating, right? The, that, that kind of group of people who, I mean, now we're seeing an extreme of it, but who have essentially just come to live in their own reality without any facts at all um, and are completely distrustful of any authority. You know, they don't trust the news, forget universities and college professors. I mean, you're the quacks, not, you know, that's, that's the, the kind of way they see it uh, and they talk about it. Relatedly, though, I want to ask you all um, to talk a little bit about how you're experiencing this moment as historians. In particular, I'm talking about the, the waning days of the Trump presidency and these kind of increasing attacks on, well, history, how we talk about history, whose history we tell, the attacks on, you know, the 1619 Project, trying to, you know, trying to ban that in schools, the um, claims of uh, the 17, this uh, kind of doesn't look like it's going to come to pass now, but the 1776 commission and this kind of emphasis on patriotic education, even in um, Mississippi this week, the governor announced looking into possibly creating patriotic education for schools there. Now, I know you all are history professors, but you've thought somewhat about history teaching in general and history teachers at, in general. And so I'm just curious to hear how you're experiencing this kind of public encroachment on public, you know, maybe it's public scrutiny, maybe it's, is it government um, overstepping? And, you know, how does it affect the way that you're thinking about the ways that you teach, the things that you say? Um, and maybe first in the classroom, and then we can shift to thinking about the public sphere. Laura, how are you? Why don't we start with you on this one? Well, I, you know, I'm fascinated by um, the the Mississippi governor talking about uh, investing in patriotic education, because that's exactly what historians think they're doing when they're challenging <laughs> these founding ideas. They're nurturing academic freedom by holding up the highest principles and examining them and, and offering new pathways to think about those things. Historians think that's patriotic. <laughs> um, and, and I have not met a historian who believes in sort of a teardown project for the sake of teardown, right? We lean into our method to rebuild, to reimagine. Um, and, and all, you know, and by the way, and Hassan's podcast is a lot about this, that in all 60 social movements, for example, took their democracy so seriously, they were willing to die for it, right? And, and one of the beautiful things about teaching these movements or moments when people are questioning freedom is to just sit in awe at their patriotism, the audacity of their demand um, in the face of overwhelming evidence that they're not going to get what they're demanding. That's the kind of patriotism um, that people feel threatened by. And I still must admit that I'm puzzled by that. Um, so that's in the classroom. Um, you know, as a researcher, I just, I, I always think about archival access as the sign of academic freedom, right? My questions have to take me to the archives and the archives have to be open in order for me to take my questions back to my classroom. So that flow is, is always going between my, my research and my teaching. Hassan, 
Why don't you go next? Yeah, so, no, Dr. McEnany hit the, hit the nail on the head. I mean, that is the highest form of patriotism, if you ask me. I mean, it's the critical analysis of the past. I mean, it's what historians do, right? It's trying to understand America's American historians in this context, but historians jump, trying to understand the past so we can make sense of the present. So hopefully the students that we're in, interacting with can build, can build a, a, bit, a better future. Um, I am not uh, one in particular who will be taking curriculum advice from a lost cause governor, right? From the state of Mississippi. I mean, that's just not, I'm just not inclined to do that. Um, but, and, and, and so as we've seen this, um, the, you know, this bubbling up, this uh, the, uh, negative response, so 1619 project and the like, like I haven't seen the, that hasn't affected me in the classroom, in my classroom, right? In my space, right? I, 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 that, I haven't had any concerns or worries about that. But where I have seen it, and this is really troubling and problematic, is with the school districts that I that I work with, the teachers that I do professional development with, and hearing from their, and this is the danger, right? Like the, the fear is not that the Department of Education, if the Trump administration continued on, would suddenly mandate new curriculum in the 1776 yeah. business, right? Like that wasn't gonna happen. But the fact that they make this stance and now you have, you know, a Senator Cotton in Arkansas saying you must, we must have this and all, that then trickles down, right? And, and where you begin to feel it is parents, right? So you got 70 million people that voted one particular way, right, for Donald Trump. Now you got parents in there who are now pressuring school districts, who are pressuring teachers, who are pressuring principals, saying, no, you, know, how, you can't talk about slavery. You can't talk about 1619. You can't mention Black Lives Matter. And that puts those teachers in a very uh, um, a precarious position. I have to shout out this last thing. I, was, I had a conversation with teachers just about this very thing. And they were saying, you know, you know he had some cardboard cutouts. This is, the, this is the world of Zoom, right? And he had some cardboard cutouts of some African-American historical figures like sitting in the seats as you would like a basketball game, right? And, and, and just so the students could, you know, kind of see over his shoulder, there were some people there. And, a, you know, a white parent, you know, is complaining, right? Like this is indoctrination and all this, right? It's Frederick Douglass, right? What are you talking about? And, and so he goes and, you know, he gets called and summoned to his uh, principal, his, his administrator, and say, yo, you know, kind of what's going on? And the teacher said, they don't get to win anymore. Like they don't get to win anymore. Like they don't get to shut us down when what we're actually teaching is truth. When what we're actually teaching is what these students need to hear. And I was encouraged by that. But it also says that that is really where kind of the front line of this battle for academic freedom really is. When you start politicizing history in that way, it's kind of at the K through 12. I'm really glad Hassan brought that up because this is a panel about academic freedom, but the three panelists that Jonathan kindly invited all have it. Yeah. You know, we're all tenured and um, we have enormous protections. I mean, the things I'd have to do to get fired, they're so bad I can't even say them. Right. All right. I mean, I just have the ultimate sinecure. Um, and that is not the case for the vast majority of our teachers, first at the college level, who are now majority adjuncts. Um, and contingent faculty who often have very few tenure protections. And then at the K through 12 level, it's really grim. You know, the courts have really restricted what it is teachers are allowed to say. And I think that's a really important context. Um, to come back to the recent debates about history, I, I think I take maybe a slightly more pedestrian approach, which is anytime people are arguing about history, it's good. Um, you know, uh, um, I think that the debate over history right now framed by the, you know, Trump's patriotic education thing in the 1619 project, I think, frankly, it's one of the most promising things that's happened in my field since I became a historian, because the really crucial questions are coming to the surface. So one of the books that I wrote was actually about this subject, about the history of history teaching. And the argument I tried to make was that the curriculum ended in the 90s had become more small d democratic insofar as it was admitting more players, right? If anybody says now that the middle school history textbooks are only about white men, they haven't opened up one, right? right? Of course they were for many, many years. Now they're not. That's why it's like 800 pages long and the kids are getting back problems carrying around the textbook. Like you want something about Kazaki Americans? There's like a sidebar about that, like and the great things Kazaki Americans have done. But the accent here is great because you look at the cover of the book and it's the same, right? Quest for freedom, you know, rise of the American nation. 
And it was, I think, Jim Lohan who pointed out that the physics textbook is not called Triumph of the Atom, right? And so the point I tried to make in my book was that in some ways this was great and it was small d democratic because of course, many of these populations have been either excluded or you know, uh, um, denigrated. And so it's certainly an achievement to see them included, but it wasn't democratic in the sense that we just folded them into the same story without using their inclusion to ask new questions about the story. And I think really that's what's happening now. And, and that book is gonna have his 20th anniversary edition in a year and a half, and I'm gonna do a, a revised edition because it kind of doesn't hold anymore. And in, in a weird way, it's sort of thanks to Trump. As much as I loathe Trump, it's kind of thanks to what happened, bringing these questions to the fore, because the point of the 1619 Project is exactly the opposite of what I just said. It won't do just to add more people or more groups like you do a spice. What you need to do is think about what those experiences do to that broader story. And I think that's what the 1619 Project is trying to do. Um, and that's also why it's provoked such a reaction because a lot of people don't want to reconsider that story. Right, those founding, enduring, uh, you know, enduring values, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a unity, diversity and pluralism and freedom and liberty, the quest for liberty and that, that notion also of it um, being an almost like automatic progression to a better world, right? You know, like uh, the past was not as good and, but there were kernels of goodness. And now that we've made those more universal, um, you know, yeah. one day, there's, one there's day soon, it's going to be done, right? Yeah, yeah, but the, but the slope is going up. Yeah, instead of like, what is the slope in the first place? Like, are we a nation of liberty? What does that even mean? Um, now, I should also say that there have been some very legitimate criticisms of the 1619 Project, which I also take seriously and appreciate. And I've also written about this because I was very troubled to read that in some school districts, there were some teachers that were refusing to entertain those. Um, and a legitimate criticism would be, you know, like Sean Mullen saying, well, this really kind of downplays all the both black and white abolitionists, right, that were at the heart of this international movement. Um, it's true the nation was born in unfreedom, but it was also born in freedom. And, you know, Mullen thinks that the 1619 Project didn't really do justice to the freedom side. That's a perfectly legitimate critique. And I was very disturbed to find that there were some school districts where they said, no, you can't, you can't entertain that. Like there's a new sheriff in town, you know, it's called the 1619 Project. That won't do, right? I mean, that's just substituting one orthodoxy for another. It doesn't make us smarter or more democratic. And I think that's where teachers, the K-12 teachers, Professor Jeffries was talking about need support. Right, that we and and we've talked about this at the AHA. How are we supporting those teachers in those classrooms where they have less freedom? They have uh, fear as more a part of their considerations. That that isn't to say they're not going forward because they are. But um, how do we support those teachers, those K twelve teachers? What tools do they do need? What what moves do they need? Um, to teach in a time like this, but to teach that material. Um, and I think in my classroom space, um, it, it, it's interesting because I experience the freedom you're both talking about, but I'm conscious, I wanna add something here. I'm conscious as a woman that I might be challenged more when I'm teaching hard history. Um, and so when I'm moving into those spaces where um, I know there might be some controversy. Again, I, I feel confident. I lean on the method. I lean on the method all the time. But um, I think different teachers feel different degrees of safety depend depending on the body that walks into the classroom that day. Oh, that, is, that is so true. And, and not only different degrees of safety, I mean, literally it becomes a physical safety thing as we've seen over the last 20 years or so. Uh, with sort of student shootings and harassment and stuff like that. So there is literally that. But even sort of, okay, what kind of pushback am I going to get today? And that, and that becomes, uh, certainly for me, and we think about sort of this academic freedom. And, and again, to the point, uh, Jonathan, that you made at the very beginning, that we don't live in sort of these, these isolated bubbles of our classroom. You know, here, here teaching in Ohio, we get a lot of 80% of the students are from Ohio. And we get a lot of students from suburbs white suburbs, all white suburbs and, and rural, rural counties, like, you know, all, almost all white rural counties. 
And, you know, it almost, especially when I would teach these large US history surveys, it was sort of GE classes, you know, 200 students. And, you know, without a doubt, you know, I get the, you know, the, the, there would always be a couple kids and one kid in particular about halfway through the semester, you know, he would come up to me and be like, you know, Dr. Jeffries, you know, I just have to tell you, whisper and whisper, you know, hush tones that my grandmother warned me about you. And I'm like, who's your grandmother, right? Like, do I, did we go to college? Like, I, do we ever, like, who's your grandmother? And it's like, no, so, you know, it's sort of the, the liberal professor and this, that, and the other, right? It's like, and, you know, and it turns out that you're not, you know, you're kind of open to these ideas. But I also, but I know that's there, right? Without having said a word. And so one of the things that I have to do in sort of creating that classroom, because, you know, just exactly what you had said, Laura, like this sort of, okay, well, I know I'm going to get to these issues, is at the, be the very beginning of the semester, I have, to, I have to sort of step back and like, hey, hey, everybody, you know, I'm not trying to change anybody's mind. Like, I mean, this is like, hey, I have, you have particular freedom to thought of thought too, but I do ask you to have an open mind. And I do ask you to make arguments based on evidence, going back to the method that you were talking about. So, but I, cause I know what's coming down the road. I know you had these conversations with grandma, right? With your Nana before she sent you off here to the big city, right? That, that we have to deal with that. But I think as teachers, that's part of that management, right? That's part of, right. you know, in that space, what are we going to encounter and how do we anticipate it? Right, and, and look, I'd like to just say one indirect thing on behalf of grandma, which is that when grandma says that there's a certain degree of liberal indoctrination that occurs on our campuses, grandma's right. It's a slur to imagine prima facie that, you know, Hassan is going to be doing it. But there's pretty good research showing this and the students know it. And the students tell surveyors that uh, many of them feel they have to express a certain ideology in order to uh, succeed in a course. And that's a problem. You know, I think sometimes it's, it's exaggerated by the right, but just because the right is exaggerating something doesn't mean it's totally wrong. But is, is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it indoctrination? That was my question, yeah. Or is, yeah. It, or is it held beliefs, right? I mean, because I think right. that's, that's different. Like indoctrination, you must believe what I believe. Precisely, precisely. Right? And, and, and I, think, I think that's different. And that has to do with the tone you set. And it sounds like you said a terrific one. Uh, I don't think everybody does what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, you know, um, uh, uh, I think when you do express a view that's your own, you have to make it absolutely clear that it's your own and that nobody is necessarily enjoying to share it. But, you know, you are the adult in the room, you are grading them, right? And, you know, I think it's, I think it's interesting. We love to talk about power now, power everywhere, power in the classroom, right? Often that's excluded from this discussion, but it's real, right? We do absolutely have power. And that's why we have to tread lightly, not in expressing ourselves, right? But in making clear that when we are speaking from our own political perspective, that it's just that, you know? Um, uh, it, it's, it's uh, you know, we're, we're not, we don't live in some Olympian removed from all this. We're political creatures, you know? And Alexander Michael John, who is, I think, the most important philosopher that the Americans, Americans know the least about, he wrote a very famous essay about this where he actually said that he thinks that all teachers should tell the students exactly what they think about every political issue. I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't want to require teachers to do it. But his argument was along these lines, he, his famous aphorism was slaves can't teach freedom. He said, like, how are you going to model the kind of political exchange that Laura was describing earlier, if you pretend that you're some neutral figure that's above it, you know, uh, you're not. You're a human being in full, and, and you have political attitudes and orientations and passions just like anybody else. But in the same breath, he said, you also have to make sure that you're educating and not propagandizing, right? So it's perfectly fine to express these. Indeed, he thought it was actually necessary but in the same breath, you have to make it clear that other people don't have to share them. And that's hard. I mean, it's complicated. Um, you are powerful. Yeah. yeah. Let's turn here. I want something you brought up a minute ago, academic freedom, tenure, the confidence. You all seem to say that you don't feel this moment, you know, encroaching on what you say. But professors across the country, even tenured ones, particularly at private institutions, are extremely wary of, uh, of um, are growing in many places more wary of how they talk about things. And I wanted to ask you, you know, what, going back to some of the things that we were talking about at the, the beginning around harm, do you think there is justification for some of the cases we've seen, uh, in particular, a kind of move where 
Uh, Professor, and well, let's start with just things that are said in classroom. Uh, obviously, many of those things are now being uh, more easily recorded, but there was recording of professors going on before COVID. It's just in some ways made, you know, a lot, a lot easier. Um, but what we've seen are professors, you know, you students clamor for a professor to be punished. Sometimes it results in a suspension or a kind of removal from the class. Sometimes it's even over just a few words, a few choice words, even a professor might apologize. We've also seen professors fired. So there were two professors fired this fall, both had tenure at private institutions. And their the seeming like crux of both of those cases was saying the N word in a classroom where someone recorded it, and then they were kind of brought in on disciplinary charges. So when you think about, you know, how you're talking about things in the classroom, how you're talking about history, I mean, how you talk with the honesty about the brutality, which you must, I assume, when talking about American or global or any really any topic, um, you know, is there some, you know, set of terms or phrases that you think really ought to be you know, unsayable in classrooms, or has this climate just gotten out of control? Well, I, I think context matters. I think context always matters. And it and it's, so I'm not a big fan of sort of, you know, blanket, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, rules that say you, you can, you can't, period, there's no, there's no, that is not a line to cross. So I, I think context matters, but that being said, I also think that you have to understand as a professor, using the example of the N word, that when you, if you use that term, how you use that term, when you, you do not control how people hear that. And, and so that's part of that, you know, sort of what are the consequences of it, right? And how are people going to respond and react in this particular moment, knowing that, you know, for some, they will cringe, but for others, they will be energized and animated by it, right? I mean, that becomes part of the problem of the use of the term. But again, I mean, the context of it all matters. I mean, my advice in general, advice is just, you don't have to breathe life into it, right? I mean, that's just my own advice. But the, but the, the separate question is like, okay, if it's used, what is the context? And then what might be, how should we respond as a classroom, as a community, et cetera. And then what is the sort of track record, other things then uh, connect to it. But I mean, I think that there's some stuff you almost have to go case by case. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. The context is the word that came into my head too. What is the dynamic of the classroom? What kinds of relationships are you building or have you built with students already? Um, do you have classroom norms in which if someone makes a mistake, you have accountability structures that are peer created, right? You have restorative justice practices in a classroom. Um, you've had upfront agreements um, that if we see this word in a historical context, we, we might feel comfortable uttering it. Did the classroom make that agreement, right? Um, so, so I think the context matters, the relationships matter. And this is why um, I'm not, particularly feeling paranoid on Zoom, but the visibility, you know, I, I'm, I'm not on social media and I am feeling, I think, a new vulnerability because I'm on TV every day. Mm -hmm. And that's just, I don't even know how to take a selfie. So I'm just, I'm not <laughs> used to that. Um, so, so I think there is more vulnerability there because people can pluck it and take it out yeah. of context. And historian, any judgment a historian renders is based on context. Um, and I would advise administrators to pay attention to context, to follow the method, um, because it can help us make better decisions, both about the mistake and the accountability part. You know, I take, I take all these comments seriously. I think context matters. And I think as Hassan said, you can't control how people are going to react. Um, and it's gonna depend on their subjectivities and it's gonna depend on their identities and their experiences. But you can't control the way the institution reacts. And I want to be absolutely clear on some of these cases, the institution has thrown the scholar directly under the bus. Mm -hmm. Like what happened to Philadamo at, at Augustana? You know, I mean, he used the N word. Augsburg. From, Augsburg. Oh, sorry, Augsburg. Yeah, sorry. All um, right, I was looking at reading, this morning, so I know. <laughs> re reading from a James Baldwin essay. Now look, again, like Hassan said, you can't control how people react. 
and you shouldn't. I am in no way contesting and never would the fact that some of Adamo's students of color objected to his use of the term. That's their right. Um, what I object to is the way that the school threw Adamo under the bus as if he had called somebody that name. It was context free. You know, it was from Baldwin who used the term advisedly for his own purpose. And whenever I'm asked about this, it's not that infrequent. What should we do? This came up. I'm like, how about assigning Randy Kennedy's book about the history of the N-word? And everybody says, no, nope, we can't do that. That doesn't speak well of our institutions. You know, I mean, it's a, you know, I'm sure some of you have seen the book. It's just a very straightforward kind of history and exploration of the different meanings and yes, the different contexts of the term. If we can't do that, I think we have a problem. Yeah, no, I, no argument there. Um, I think what it, what it, what that case and what other cases I think like it demonstrate and this should come as no surprise is that our institutions of higher education usually lack courage, right? I mean, like the, 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 those, you know, you know, the, the, the upper administration, they, they lack courage. I, I mean, how many have actually of, of the hundreds uh, have stood up when uh, the Trump administration said, we're not going to talk about, you know, uh, you know, we're going to withhold money or cut funding from you know, diversity. A, for diversity, right? And it, it's crickets. You're crickets, right? That's the lack of moral courage, right? Well, sometimes you say, no, no, no. We understand context. We understand uses. We've done this, but we see it in so many other things as well, right? I mean, whether right. it's cases of harassment and all these other things, you know, the lack in the courage. So, you know, it's it's not surprising, but it still is disappointing uh, that. Yeah, we also, that let's also remind ourselves that that the ritual sacrifice of Philadelphia was not brought to us by Trumpians. Right, right. right. No. I mean, it was brought to you, brought to us by people, I'm sure, who loathe Trump as much as I do. No, get it. I totally get it. <laughs> on, on that question of courage, you know, it's also, from my perspective, I see so many campuses where uh, there have been white supremacist flyers or kind of hateful things on campus. And the answer is, well, that's free speech. But then when it came to defending or standing against this diversity uh, order, right, this order trying to stop diversity trainings, that, that defense was absent. Uh, and it's such an easy one. It's such an obvious one. It's surprising to me how how silent the sector has been. Right. Yeah. And and I think this is where we were talking about the power we have in higher ed. This is where we need to use the power and the freedom we have in higher ed because we have it. We need to use it. And when this is happening on our campuses, faculty need to ask questions. We need to get involved. We need to state the principles that are are at stake. Um, in real terms, in administrative terms, in human terms, right? We need to center the teacher on their worst day and say, what process do they deserve on their worst day? What kind of transparency do they deserve on their worst day? Because they're feeling that mistake as a teacher. <laughs> um, and, and right, that, that is their working condition. That is a student's learning condition as teachers unions have pointed out. So we, we need to stand as faculty. We, use, we need to use the power we have to make statements, to start talking. Um, that silence is not helping, um, not just the sort of public culture, um, but it's not helping our profession in general. Well, I, had, I do think groups of faculty have done that, right? I think in some cases, uh, professional associations, academic associations were some of the most ardent in speaking out against the uh, executive yeah. order and on speaking out on other issues. It's hard to organize. It's time consuming. It's, it's, it's not what people imagine is their priorities in a week. So it can be difficult. Yeah. I, and I, the AHA is writing, a. we are tired of writing letters. We are very busy <laughs> writing letters. <laughs> Jim Grossman is in his office is somewhere right now writing his office. office. Um, but, but, um, but I want to say that I want to say that oh, I'm hearing an echo. I'm hearing an echo. Um, but I want to say that I, I feel that it, my comment earlier was when we're at these institutions watching someone get disciplined, right? This is when faculty need to say what's going on there, right? We can use our professional organizations to do that and we should. But when we're watching it happen in our institutions, 
often we are silent because they wall it off as a personnel issue. But I think we need to use some of the power to sort of say, what's going on there? How can we be allies for a good discovery process? I want to invite anyone who's in the audience, if you have a question, you want to put it in the chat box. We have uh, about eight minutes left and we're happy to take anything from the audience. Um, but one question I do have for you, we didn't get to yet, is kind of social media and the internet, the Wild West and the things that it has kind of opened up as a realm for people to get very angry about what people say, um, to take people's comments online very seriously and almost and often threaten or even sometimes punish them for um, tweets and the like. So my question is here is, is there anything that you think a person responsible for teaching students should not be able to say on social media? Should we seek and enforce any limits at all? And I've seen this challenge, I should say, across the political spectrums. I've seen it used against professors for saying progressive, you know, espousing progressive political positions on Twitter uh, and conservative ones. Um, any thoughts on this? Well, you know, um, I've tried to distinguish in my own writing between two kinds of political correctness, one that I find utterly defensible and the other that I find utterly indefensible. The first kind is the expression of kind of slurs and outright bigoted comments that again, don't have any grounding in truth um, and don't do any to, anything to advance discussion. So if there were say a historian who tweeted out that the Holocaust never happened, um, I, you know, I'm not saying I would want that person fired because I'm not sure that I would, but I would say that there should be some professional consequences for that. Again, not because it's hateful, although it is, but because it's false. Um, and there should be professional norms surrounding the, the, uh, uh, that distinction between truth and falsity. But at the same time, I don't want to erect political correction, correctness too which is really the imposition of certain ideological litmus tests. Um, and that's where we get into trouble. So, you know, an example that I've cited in a bunch of my books is it turns out that about 40% of the full-time professoriate opposes the use of race in college admissions. Um, I should tell you just because on Michael John grounds, I wanna say where I stand, I'm actually in the 60%. I think that's actually been quite a boon for higher ed since the 60s. But I was troubled to see the 40% number, not because they're scholars that disagree with me, which I welcome, but because they're obviously not expressing themselves because they're afraid. And that can't be good for the academy. I'd go even farther. It can't be good for affirmative action, uh, which could only benefit from an actual debate. So I think where we get into trouble is where we equate a slur um, and a political position. Are there flat out racists who oppose affirmative action? Well, sure, David Duke opposes affirmative action. Does it therefore follow that every human being, including uh, Asians and African-Americans who oppose affirmative action are racist? It does not. Um, and so I think we just have to be really careful about what it is we're interdicting. Well, and while I, just to stay with that example, because I think it's a useful one and mm -hmm. is a, thinking about, and I agree, we shouldn't indict people for their ideological or even policy beliefs. But here's the concern, and I'm saying that I think this is the real concern then. If you take that out, not, assuming that it's, it's not the David Duke person character, but you know, for the student of color who then is in that person's class, you say, you know, well, what do they think of me, right? That sort of being here. Do, is the, do I need to be worried and concerned that my grade is going to be somehow affected negatively because there's an assumption I'm not supposed to be here. And, you know, that's just the reality of right. the, the, the situation that I, that is, that is, you know, that it's unfair for the student. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea how you, you know, how you manage that or how you deal with it, but it is, mm -hmm. it's one of the concerns that comes from that. And it's part of the debate. It's part of the discourse. Stephen Carter wrote a whole book about this, right? Reflections of an, affirm of an affirmative action baby. And I think you share that with the students. You know, you don't deny it. You don't will it away. Um, you know, uh, Clarence Thomas has written at length about how you know he felt essentially diminished by affirmative action because he thought it created an assumption that he somehow was lesser. You know, and so I think the concerns you're talking about are absolutely real. 
and um, they have deep roots. They're difficult to deal with. I can't say I have all the answers for how to deal with them, but I do know that simply ignoring them will not help. Mm. Yeah. I, you know, but to sort of think, to, to think about John's question about, is there anything teachers should be able to say on social media or should there be some guardrails? I, you know, I, we're back to the Charles Barkley question. Am I a role model? <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not on social media, but I do wonder, it, it, is there responsible engagement that a teacher always has to model, even on Twitter, when they're being funny, when they're letting you into their private lives? Um, I don't know. There's a teacher part of me that feels like I'm just, I'm a teacher at the grocery store. I'm a teacher yeah. at my, in my community meeting. I'm a teacher when I'm a neighbor. I, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher in all those spaces and maybe that has to inform the what I'm tweeting and how I'm tweeting, how I'm engaging. I think it absolutely does, right? I mean, because professional norms do that. Um, uh, uh, you know, a psychiatrist is not going to prattle on about a patient's darkest secrets on a crowded subway train. And a lawyer is not going to divulge like their strategy loudly to the other, if the other side is listening. Um, but, but, I mean, well, I but, but ironically, perhaps, everywhere. but ironically, you know, some of the professors who've come under some of the most extreme heat for this are ones who would say they are exercising a duty of those responsibility. They are thinking of their responsibility. And often it's, you know, their responsibility to oppose President Trump or their responsibility right. to speak in unvarnished terms about, I don't know, the detention of children at the Southern border. I mean, so a lot of those professors actually, I have found, I met these people, that is the rationale they offer, but then they're accused of being, you know, uncivil or provocative or snarky or um, right. you know, calling for violence or um, calling for other kinds of, you know, kind of sort of implying violence or uh, uh, incivility or disrespect. And so it's really quite challenging in how we think about it and how we might define these as kind of universal, you know, truths. That's precisely why we have to tread super lightly here, right? And again, distinguish between comments that, while they may piss off some people, are defensible and legitimate, and then comments that simply aren't. You know, like teachers that go onto the net and say, "God, my students are so stupid," and you know, I I, I wish I didn't have to teach them. To me, that's different from the thing about the borders and cages. You know, because the borders and cages, again, it seems to me that there are legitimate voices on all sides. And even on the question of the tone you use, there are legitimate voices on all sides. But there is no defense for going onto the net and calling your students stupid. There just isn't. I mean, I've never heard of one. All right. Well, we're just about out of time. Final thoughts, Laura, Hassan. Go ahead, Hassan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I think. I mean, this has been a great conversation. I'm so uh, grateful to have been a part of it um, in, in listening and, and, and learning and thinking more. I have even more questions on the back end of it than I had on the front end. So that's the sign of a great dialogue and conversation. You know, and, and I think one of the things that, that I'm, that's still unresolved in my mind, and, and I, I certainly don't think I'm alone here, is that yes, it is um, sort of the freedom to say, right? But but we still have to pay attention to what it is that is being said, right? Like, like there's, there's that, that, that's still, and, and it's not a hard and fast line, right? I mean, it's, it's you kind of, you, you know it when you see it kind of thing, right? But it, it, it's the context, it's the case by case. And I think that's what makes it difficult and challenging when thinking about ac academic freedom, when thinking about where is that line, when thinking about, you know, is it in the classroom? Is it outside of the classroom? You know, because all of the things that we talked about this afternoon, I mean, are factors that play in, right? And, and it's not one thing that you could say, oh, there it is. So therefore, you know, this has to be the consequence. Um, but, but I do know this, that we do have to protect it and we do have to guard sort of academic freedom uh, and not just for us, you know, uh, in higher ed, but through K through 12, like that is so critically important to give our teachers the space to teach Right, and then to have their backs as administrators, the courage of administrators to have their backs to say, no, 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 they're doing the right thing. We have to let them do it and trust that they will. 
uh, do the right thing by their students. Right, right. I, I absolutely echo that. And I would go back to something I said at the very beginning, because we've been talking a lot about classroom spaces, right, in professional development spaces in K-12, especially, right, about centering those students who don't feel safe in school, centering students who haven't felt represented either in our scholarship or in our teaching methods. And, you know, safe, safety, I, I don't know, I'm sort of wavering between what's the word I want to use. I want to make my students feel safe to learn, to roam, to test, to make mistakes. That's freedom. And I wonder if we need to be talking more about freedom rather than safety. I, I, I don't know. But then, right, creating that freedom space means that other people might feel unsafe by what you say. But, but, I, but I think I, one of the takeaways is we have to train teachers to deal in this moment, right? Um, teacher fear is real. This is delicate. This is complex. And, uh, you know, uh, higher ed teachers don't have training. We are not trained in the way that Cal K-12 teachers are trained. We go into a classroom with almost no pedagogical training. So let's help those teachers. Let's help them maneuver and manage this moment and support them. John, last comment. Uh, yeah, first of all, I, I really want to thank Jonathan Friedman for bringing us all together. You know, uh, in a really short period of time, Jonathan has made PEN America, I think, the most important voice or one of the most important voices in the country about the issues we're talking about. And uh, we're all in his debt for that. Um, just to add a couple other things uh, to these eloquent comments, um, when you study K through 12 teachers and you ask them, was dealing with controversy part of your pre-service training? Most of them say no. So I take Laura's point correctly. We're certainly not trained for it. But alas, even people who are, quote, trained from the, for the classroom actually aren't, or often aren't, trained for the sort of dialogues that we're talking about. Finally, since it came up in both comments, you know, um, uh, I do think we need to rethink these metaphors of safety and harm. Um, uh, and I'd just like to tell one very brief story that I hope illustrates it. Um, I become friends with Mary Beth Tinker, the, the woman who, when she was 13, wore the black armband to her uh, Warren Harding Middle School in, in Des Moines, Iowa. And she's not that much older than I am. And she's, by the way, herself, a terrific voice for freedom. Um, she came up to my class at Penn. And she actually brought her armband, which she carries in her purse, which I think is sort of weird. Like, shouldn't that be like in the National Archives? Like, what, what do you have, like a copy of the Declaration of Independence in there also? Anyway, she does her rap. And the students say, look, you are fighting the good fight, right? You were fighting the Vietnam War. This Milo Yiannopoulos clown, this like Ann Coulter joker, you know, like all they do is hurt people and make them feel unsafe and harm them. And for, for whatever it's worth, and I think it's worth a lot, Mary Beth Tinker was not having it. Here's what she said. She said, listen, at Warren Harding Middle School, I had peers, kids, who had fathers and brothers that were dying in Southeast Asia in 1965. Do you think they weren't offended and harmed by the snot-nosed kid wearing this symbol saying that their loved ones were dying for a lie? Of course they were. If you think otherwise, you're not thinking. Speech hurts, speech harms. But if that's gonna be your rubric, Mary Beth Tinker's out, man. And so are you. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the, you know, the power of speech, let's say. Um, I wanna just take a moment to thank our uh, co-sponsor for today's conversation, the American Historical Association, uh, Laura McEnany, uh, John Zimmerman, and Hassan Kwame Jefferson Jeffries uh, for being with us today. And um, for our audience, if you're interested in today's conversation, we'll be back on the Common Room in two weeks on Friday, December 4th. And we'll be focusing in that hour specifically on the rights of adjunct faculty. So please do stay tuned to our channels. That's uh, where we're going next. And thank you all so much for being with us today.